trying to get things moving in U.S. relations with China, in the economy, in public stock offerings, and in producing cars. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, contributor Larry Summers of Harvard on how the Fed is handling a stronger than expected economy. Still think the Fed is considerably too optimistic. Stephen Ratner of Willett Advisors on a car industry at a crossroads. For the Detroit companies to be winners in EV, they need help from the unions. And Jose Manaya of Nuveen on investment ideas you may not have thought of. That narrative, which was one that was largely academic around alternatives and how do you get a better portfolio, better correlated assets, today it's not an academic discussion, it's an urgency. This week, Global Wall Street watched as people tried to get started, or at least back on track, around the world. President Biden went to the United Nations to send China a message that there's still room for cooperation. I want to be clear and consistent. We seek to responsibly manage the competition between our countries. We are for de-risking, not decoupling with China. We will push back on aggression and intimidation and defend the rules of the road. Fed Chair Jay Powell steps to the podium to get everyone to believe in that soft landing after all. Soft landing is a primary objective, and I did not say otherwise. That's what we've been trying to achieve for all this time. The public offering market took another step forward with Instacart finally going on sale on the NASDAQ. We have the shares of Instacart trading higher by 39% right now, so we're looking at a valuation uh, that is closer to $14 billion. Quickly followed by eMarketer Clark. Well, the way we think about it is that part of being a public company is showing the world, you know, how you run your business and saying that you're going to be there for a long time. The auto industry tried to get going again, leading to the UAW expanding its strike to additional plants at the end of the week. We will be striking 38 locations across 20 states, across all nine regions of the UAW. The equity markets reacted to all of this, and particularly what came out of the Fed by selling off, with the S&P 500 having its worst week since March, down 2.93% for the week to 4320. That is falling below the median year-end forecast of our Bloomberg L's. That's 4435. While the Nasdaq took an even bigger hit, dropping just over 3.6%. The yield on the 10-year added almost 10 full basis points, ending the week at 4.4317 after spike above 4.5 early in the day on Friday. Here to help us sort it all out are Peter Kraus, chair and founder of Aperture Investors, and Sarah Ketter, CEO and co-founder of Causeway Capital. Welcome back to both of you. Peter, let me start with you. What is going on in the markets? I didn't think what the Fed had to say was that radically different from what we'd heard before, but boy, the market sure reacted this time. Well, look, in the short run, what the markets are reacting to is their expectation of where interest rates are going to be in 24. Investors believed that the Fed was going to be able to engineer a soft landing, which Powell, again, reiterated he was trying to do. But investors believed that in 24, interest rates would begin to be cut. And the Fed has been a little bit more hawkish on that. The Fed has said, well, there's probably another rate increase this year. And if you look at the dot, which is the explanation of the committee's estimation of where rates are going to be, those dots moved up. And that's what unsettled the market. Now, that's a very short-term activity, but the market reacted significantly to that. Sir, at the same time, the Fed, I thought, said, boy, the, the economy, if anything, looks stronger than we thought it would before. Is that good news or bad news? I mean, if it's stronger than we thought, does that mean actually the Fed will have to keep pushing on the interest rates, which could lead to something breaking? Likely. It appears the Fed might have underestimated how insensitive the U.S. market is to rise. U.S. economy is to rising rates. There's um, many... Corporates, for example, have termed out their debt. So longer duration debt at fixed rate creates a level of insulation to, to what the Fed is doing. So there may be less sensitivity, but ultimately, as rates remain higher for longer, this will catch up with those who have borrowed too much or where assets prices are falling, thinking in particular about parts of the real estate sector. Uh, Peter, what about the real estate sector? As we, we don't want anything to break, but it's a decided possibility, I think it's fair to say. Is that what we should be looking at? So the real estate sector in the economy breaks into two pieces. There's the residential real estate business, which is very large and affects a lot of people. And to Sarah's point, is the part of the economy that is very rate insensitive today because most mortgages today are fixed rate. 
and they were fixed at low interest rates. So households today have a big, big benefit. They own a very long liability or effectively an asset to them at very low rates, which allows them to continue to spend and gives them positive operating leverage in their, in their daily budgets. In the commercial space, however, that's totally different. In the commercial space, there you had buyers buying buildings at low cap rates and low interest rates, which do need to be refinanced. And there, Sarah, again, is absolutely correct. We are going to see refinancing. That is going to cause problems in the real estate business. We've already seen that. We've seen significant owners in real estate over the last six months literally walk away from buildings. That's highly and then, unusual. And this comes at a time when bank credit is tightening, too. So it's a bit of a double whammy. Well, and, and Sarah, let me ask you, some people are now saying, forget about the longer for, uh, higher for longer. What if it's higher forever? I mean, what, what if this basically is a new normal, as it were? What does that do to the investment proposition? Well, it, cycles don't normally work that way. Our expectation is, at Caldway is that the Fed will achieve its 2% or thereabouts level of inflation, but that will come at cost of employment. And as the U.S. economy shifts downward and slows dramatically, that in turn will precipitate the Fed easing. But that might not happen again for quite a while. It could be several more quarters. It could be a year. It could be longer. It's very hard to say. And, but the longer rates remain high, it's like a slow asphyxiation for those that are over leveraged. And there's plenty of that across this economy. In fact, there's plenty of that globally. There might be a slightly different uh, outcome there. I, certainly the Fed has said they want to get to 2%. But I don't think the Fed will consciously break the economy to get there. And it may be that we see inflation at 3%. And then the term structure of interest rates you know, may shift a bit. And perhaps the 10-year isn't going to go down to 3%. It's going to be at 5 to 6%. And cash is going to be at 3 to 4%. And that's not an unusual position for the term structure of rates to be. In fact, over the last 70 to 80 years, it was more likely that than not. And the economy can be just fine there, and stocks can do just fine there. And that, I think, is also a possibility. Sometimes, Peter, I think we tend to focus on the Fed and the economy, like that's the only two players in the game. There's also a federal government that is spending a lot of money and borrowing a lot of money. What does that mean, potentially, for the rate structure? Well, look, that's going to crowd out borrowers on the duration side. And so that is, a one, that is another reason why 10-year rates may not drop back to 3% or 3.5%. The federal government is spending a lot of money. We have three big programs, infrastructure, chips, uh, and other uh, spending programs in, in climate. Those things are going to continue no matter what. And you know, there's a multiplier effect in those programs, too. When you spend money in infrastructure, the government's basically the equity in the infrastructure. And then banks come on top. And so if you have $100 million in an infrastructure project and a bank lends two or $300 million, now you have you know, whatever that is, $400 million or $300 million, much bigger than you think. So I think that uh, the, that stimulus is going to continue. That's going to make it hard for rates to come down. We could have a complete recession, a bad recession. And then, of course, rates will come down, and we will see lower rates. But I don't think they'll stay there. So, Sarah, what about the, uh, the world of maybe a 5% tenure, or even, Peter said, 6% tenure? How, if that were the case, how would that change your investment approach? Well, the Higher real rates are great for value investors because that means a discount rate of all stock is worth is the present value of the of the cash flow can generate into perpetuity. And as that discount rate rises, it becomes more punitive for really long duration stocks, more speculative to have their earnings promised and their cash flow way out in the future. So all of a sudden, cash earned today is worth more, which means dividends are more valuable to investors and, and income up front. So I, I consider it to be capricious, which is why there have been these these moments of value outperformance and uh, and and what we do we can see for undervalued stocks. This is this is true globally, not just the U.S. market. They're showing some significant strength, and I think this is the beginning of a very long cycle as rates remain high. After all, it's 18 to 24 months typically is the time it takes after a, a rate rise, a, a Fed funds rate rise, to see an impact. The first rate rise occurred 18 months ago. We've had multiple rises since then. So this story is just starting. Peter, to what extent is the United States, uh, the markets in the United States, benefited by the fact of what's going on elsewhere, such as China, such as Europe, so the, the alternatives may be less attractive to the United States? Well, certainly for the last 10, 15 years, the U.S. has been the place to invest. China's turmoil is, is well publicized. 
uh, Europe has not grown anywhere near the, the same rate as the United States. And so the U.S. has benefited from that. We probably maintain that edge over time. I think that the U.S. economy is probably the strongest and most dynamic of all of those places. And until we see real stability and, I would say, laws that protect investors being applied effectively in China and not, you know, capricious actions on the part of government, I think the China market will continue to be challenging for external investors. Sarah Ketter of Causeway Capital and Peter Krauss of Aperture Investors will be staying with us to talk about some of the other risks market are facing right now, which include that spike in oil prices this week, something Wall Street Week has dealt with more, more than once over the years. Here's Louis Ruckheiser back in December of 2000. The year's big international economic story was oil. From below $11 a barrel just two years ago, oil climbed over $37 this past September before retreating to today's $26.80, a little more than a dollar higher than a year ago. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David West, and still with us are Peter Kraus of Aperture Investors and Sarah Ketter of Causeway Capital. So, Sarah, let me start with you. There are also some other risks out there we're seeing right now in the marketplace. One of them is that big UAW strike that actually got expanded some on Friday, at least against two of the big automakers. How big a risk is that for the markets, do you think, over the medium term? I won't even talk about longer term, but medium term. The risk for inflation in the U.S., and the, the reason why some of this comes from one of our favorite economists, Nancy Lazar, she noted that since 2016, auto industry productivity has been declining while auto industry compensation has been rising. So that means unit labor costs in the auto industry have been increasing quite significantly. So without better productivity than, and having wage hikes, this is going to make it really hard on auto industry profitability, which is why this negotiation is so incredibly fierce. The 32-hour work week is definitely not an increase in productivity. So let's just say the UAW gets what they want or something close to that. Then there's a contagion effect because labor across the country, people even globally, says, ah, we want that. And that, um, that just adds to, to labor inflation, which is something that I think the Fed is very concerned about, given how tight employment is in this country. And Peter, we're focused on the auto industry, but it's broader than the auto industry. We've already always already had the Writers Guild. They're not in talks again now. They haven't settled it. We have the actors. We had UPS. We had the ports. We've got others waiting in the wings right now. Is there the possibility of really a broader set of labor issues here that will increase wages rather substantially? I think we already have it. I mean, uh, the amount of union labor in the country we know is low. It's certainly historically low. Sarah's right about the about the demands of the UAW and what that may portend, at least for that coterie of workers. But there's a large number of workers in the country that are not unionized, that are also demanding higher wages. And we also know that we've got a very tight labor market, which is frankly the real source of the issue. Unemployment still remains relatively low. It's not rising very much. And that means labor has a stronger leg at the bargaining table. And frankly, they probably should, because the last 10 or 15 years, they haven't. So I, I think that the Fed knows that. The Fed is why the Fed is being tough on rates and why it's not talking about taking them down. Uh, and I think why it's going to be longer for, you know, higher for longer. Sarah, right now we have the strike going on with the auto industry. A, a, a week from now, it looks like the government way well shut down. A lot of people who know a lot about this say they don't see much prospects of a settlement anytime soon. If, in fact, there's a government shutdown, this would be a broad shutdown, would that have effects on the economy? Well, it certainly won't be helpful, David, and it creates more uncertainty and also tarnishes the U.S.'s image as a you know, phenomenal country with the most extraordinary economy. And we don't look quite so phenomenal and may have some upward pressure on long-term bond yields as, again, confidence is eroded. So it, it won't be helpful. We think it's unlikely to happen because these last-minute settlements are more well, typical, but um, this happened as recently as 2019, so it's certainly possible. So what about that, Peter? We've seen this play before, at least in some version. Is this more just for those of us in the news media to talk about it a lot? Does it really affect the economy, affect the markets in your experience? 
Well, the effect on the economy has to do with the duration of the shutdown. If the shutdown goes for a month or longer, of course it's going to affect the economy. The government is too large a provider of funds and spending into the economy for it not to be. If it's a short two weeks, three weeks kind of a thing, it's political drama, it's probably market drama. I think Ms. Sarah said this, but I think it's right, is that uh, investors will take their risk down, they'll try to have less uncertainty in their portfolio, but those are temporary effects. For the shutdown to have a major effect, it has to go for a long period of time. One last quick thought, if I could, uh, Sarah. What about oil? Because we did get to start to pay attention oh. to pretty expensive oil again this week. Up, up, up. Uh, WTI is U.S. crude is up 29 percent from June 1st of this year. That hurts. Oil year-to-date is up in the mid-teens percentage terms. That's that just adds to the Fed's problem because you have it's not just crude oil. It's um, every all the derivatives of that, including marine fuel, jet fuel, you name it. So all of this feeds its way into the economy and just makes the central banks their efforts much more challenging. Just and, on, yeah, I'm yeah. Go ahead, Peter. No, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt, uh, Sarah, but on oil, it's, I think yeah. it's interesting that you had this Ruckhauser piece on. Right. right. Back in that time period, right. first of all, oil went from 11 to right. 26 dollars. Right. Right. That's right. a much bigger multiple. Number one, and number two is the percentage impact of oil on the economy right. in that time right. period was right. dramatically bigger right. than it is today. Many thanks to Sarah Ketter of Causeway Capital and Peter Krauss of Aperture Investors. And this is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. As the Fed hit the theme of higher for longer once again this week, investors may need to be looking for opportunities in different places. Here for his thoughts on where those might be is Jose Manaya. He is CEO of Nuveen. So, Jose, welcome back. Great to have you on Wall Street Week. Always, always good to be here, David. Uh, so you are responsible for so many investors and their decisions. It does look like we're going to have higher rates for longer. We can talk about how much longer. But how does that change potentially investment decisions at this point? You know, I'm going to go back to a narrative we've been talking about for quite a while. If you go back in the previous decade, or we've had more than a decade long of you know, just rising markets and low interest rates, at that time, we would talk about, hey, you should be thinking about inflation. At some point, it's going to show up. By the way, you may want to have assets that are not correlated to each other in your portfolio because you may have more volatility. And by the way, rates eventually will rise. They go down over time, and it takes a while as they go back up, but they will start rising. That's why that narrative, which was one that was largely academic around alternatives and how do you get a better portfolio, better correlated assets, today it's not an academic discussion. It's an urgency, right? The idea of having a 70-30 portfolio largely in index-type, passive-type funds, that is a little bit more stressful in thinking about hitting your return targets over the long term. So again, going after things like private credit, going after things like farmland that we've talked about here before, timber, infrastructure, private equity in general. These are things that are going to be important that today largely have only been accessed by large institutional sophisticated uh, investors. Uh, there's timber land, agricultural land, other things like that. Give us a sense of how that fits into the portfolio if you do know that we're going to have inflation and higher rates for a while. Sure. And look, one of the things that where you get alpha in alternatives is purely from getting access, right? So today you, you, you look at things like farmland, real estate, private credit, largely invested by, again, large institutions. What we've seen more recently in the ultra uh, high net worth channels, you're seeing more penetration and people more demand wanting this, right, because there's an urgency. You've seen more innovation around products. So you think about farmland. We had a fund strictly for institutions. Today we have an open-ended fund that goes into wealth channels um, as well. And I think that innovation is going to continue on to get more exposure, because today the everyday investor is has virtually no, no exposure to alternatives. You think about how is it going to get there. Some of it will be through these creative funds. But I will tell you, if you think about a, le a legislation they just passed, the Secure Income Act, the idea of getting guaranteed income in traditional retirement funds, i.e. 401ks, that is maybe not a sexy way, but it is a way of giving that guaranteed income is largely backed by alternatives. It is for us in my parent company, TIA. In th those investments around farmland, those like yield enhancing type of investments support a triple A guaranteed income stream. Getting access to that in an everyday 401k fund is 
it's a way of getting access to vineyards, toll roads, and bridges. So connect the dots for me on that, because as you suggested, I tend to think of the big alternative investments as really being for the ultra high net worth people. You're talking about now, for example, teachers who are looking yes. forward to their retirement. How do they participate in some of the investments that traditionally have really been for ultra high net worth people? Well, I will tell you, you know, obviously uh, our parent company, TIA, manages money across for over 5 million participants, largely in universities across the U.S. They've been benefiting from this for the past 100 years. And again, how do they benefit? They have a guaranteed stream of income in perpetuity for their lifetime. And when we've made those, how we got into the alternative space, investing in things like farmland, private credit, timberlands, vineyards, has been around creating that stability that helps us deliver those returns back by a triple A. So they've been getting access to that through that. Again, not a very sexy way. You may not feel like you actually own a piece of a vineyard, but you are benefiting from those investment characteristics. You talked about a balanced portfolio. You managed something like $1.3 trillion worth of money. How much of that would be in alternatives, would you say? About 25, 30% of it is in alternatives. Wow, that, and, that's higher than I thought, I must and, say. And, and growing, because again, part of this is developing the platforms that gives you access to generating and, and getting these types of uh, assets. So for us, it's been through acquisition, organically, it's taken over the last 10, 20 years to once you build a platform, now we have access to this. So our exposure is growing. And again, to me, it's the best form of alpha. It's not one driven, do I pick the best security? It's just, I've just created access to something that other people don't have, and it's giving me a better risk adjusted return. If you go back just a short time ago, all the talk in investing was about ESG, supposedly. Yes. ESG, environmental social governance investing. Now we see some retrenchment. We yeah. see some of the big guys really pulling down some of the funds that they created for ESG. By the way, you see the government of the United Kingdom putting off some of the dates that, that, that we're talking about. Uh, is ESG investable at this point? Is it less investable than it was? I, I, I believe what you're hearing in the narrative today is actual tailwinds for the ESG discussion. And I say that because Ten years ago, people would ask me the question, is this thing real? People are talking about it. Do clients really want to buy it? And I would always say, you know when it's, you, you'll know when it's real when the regulators show up. You know when it's real when it becomes a political issue. And the reason is, that's when you know money is really in motion. People will wake up when money is in motion. What is not going to go away is the risks embedded in around environmental issues, climate risks. These things are hitting portfolios. What's not going away is client demand for this as well. But why you're seeing more people, the quote unquote pullback, well, a lot of the push into ESG was a narrative. It was language. It's how people talked about it. I will tell you today that whatever the retrenchment is or people moving in and out, what they're actually doing underneath isn't changing much. But now people are checking to kind of confirm what you're saying. Is this fund that you label ESG, is it really ESG? And then the other piece here that I don't find very interesting is ESG funds. We, have, we manage over $40 billion in ESG label funds. That's not unlike any other product. Somebody wants it, we can create it and sell it. It's the ethos of how you talk about your entire platform. How do you manage your investment process? Every RFP we get, we get a question from clients on that. And there's going to be more focus from regulators and others coming in in validating what you're saying. So I, I think this is the transparency of the industry needed to really get better institutionalized and provide better transparency. Jose, it's always such a treat to have you here. Thank you so much for spending time with us. That is Jose Manaya of Nuveen. Coming up, the auto industry enters the second week of selective strikes hitting the big three. We talk with where it all could end with former car czar Stephen Ratner of Willett Advisors. The more the auto workers get paid, and I'm in favor of them getting paid more, the fewer jobs they're going to be. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Automotive breakdown. That's what's happened in Detroit with the auto workers into their second week of striking selective GM, Ford, and Stellantis plants with no end in sight. President Biden has more or less sided with the UAW demand that the big three share their record profits to make up for lost time. Auto companies have uh, seen record profits, including in the last few years because of the extraordinary skill and sacrifices of the UAW workers. 
Those record profits have not been shared fairly, in my view, with those workers. While Republicans like former Vice President Mike Pence say President Biden has helped create the problem with his push for electric vehicles. What I'm hearing uh, around the country is that, that auto workers are very concerned about Joe Biden's Green New Deal heavy-handed effort to use taxpayer dollars to drive uh, these automotive companies into electric vehicle production. I mean, you've got, you got 145,000 workers out there that have been, many of them built a lifetime making, making gasoline-powered cars. And auto CEOs like GM's Mary Barrow say that whatever the politics, they need to invest all those profits so they can make the move into EVs. We need to invest in our future, and we have a plan to take all of our employees along. I think this is very important. We have worked very carefully to have a job for everyone so we can make this transformation together. And frankly, when you put it up, up, you know, have a strike and we're not making vehicles, you start to put that at risk. Some investors, like Bruce Richards of Marathon Asset Management, think the shift back from capital to labor can ultimately be good for us all. Companies in the, last, in the next few years are going to have a real issue because they're going to pay a lot higher labor costs. You see that with the UAW. You see that in Hollywood. Yep. You see that with what the pilots uh, negotiate with the airlines. The labor costs are, are, are increasing, and we love to see labor costs increase. It's good for America. Mm -hmm. It's good for Americans. But former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers warns that this may turn out to be a zero-sum game where the union can't afford to lose and the auto companies can't afford for them to win which could mean things will get worse before they get better. I fear that there's a bit of an end game dynamic going on here. And in that situation, the incentives for the union, like the incentives at one stage for the coal miners, like the incentives one stage for the steel workers, are to get as absolute much as uh, they can uh, while they can. And here to take us through the auto industry as we find it today is Stephen Ratner. He is the chairman and CEO of Will Advisors, which invests the personal and philanthropic assets of Michael R. Bloomberg. He is our founder and majority shareholder. Steve, thanks so much for being back with us. You know a little bit about cars, goodness knows, given your service in the Obama administration, putting the industry back together beforehand. Uh, is there a way out of this impasse right now? Because I sure don't see it. Look, it, it does certainly look tougher than I've ever seen in any of these contract negotiations. First of all, the UAW's demands are, even by the standard of opening demands, pretty extreme. Secondly, they're conducting this negotiation largely in public, which makes it harder for the union in particular to back off their positions if and when they need to. But all that said, there's never been a strike that I know of that hasn't gotten resolved one way or another. And it's not hard to see a resolution here, but uh, I think the mood is that it's going to take a good while. You have written in the New York Times that you certainly can understand why there needs to be more wages for auto workers. They've lagged behind for various reasons, inflation, but also the contract that they had. At the same time, it's about more than just money, is it not? Because the auto workers say, you're going to electric vehicles, which will require fewer of us. And the other side, the auto industry says, we have to go to electric vehicles or we're not going to be in business anymore. Look, the classic Harvard Business School case is that a company or an industry that tries to protect an, protect an old business model when there's a new one coming ends up failing. There's, if the Detroit companies want to be competitive, if we as a country want to have a viable domestic auto industry, we ha and, and by the way, it is the government's policy to encourage electric vehicles, then we have to welcome this change and there will be displacements and we have to deal with those. I guess I'm asking, how much of this do you think in the end is about money? Uh, how much of a raise people get, because everyone agrees they're going to get a significant raise. And how much of it is more fundamental things about the way the companies actually run their businesses? I think it's mostly about money or money-related things. Uh, I think, yes, there's a lot of concern about the future number of jobs and so on and so forth. But I'm sympathetic to the union in the sense that if you look at the last 15 years, uh, auto workers as a whole in this country have basically stayed flat after inflation, whereas other workers have gotten some after inflation real income increases and there are good reasons for good reasons there are reasons for that which is the fundamental competitiveness of the auto industry on a global scale but nonetheless uh, in a world of 3.8 percent unemployment and one and a half jobs for every American I can understand why these workers feel like it's time for them to get uh, a bigger share last week President Biden weighed in on the issue 
and at least to my hearing, weighed in pretty heavily on the UAW side, saying there had been record profits out of the car industries and there should be a record deal, I think he called it, basically. Is he making the situation better or worse? In the port situation, I don't recall him weighing in that heavily on the worker side. I, I think that's fair. Uh, I think we are closer to an election. I think we're talking about the Midwest, which are swing states. I don't think California is ever going to be a swing state. Uh, and I, and I, but I have to say, I don't think it's overly helpful uh, for him to put his finger on the scale. Uh, the, look, the politics are what they are, and I get that, but, but this is a tough situation, and I think there are equities on both sides. Whenever we have a, a very large conflict like this, in my experience at least, there are unintended consequences. There are the principal players and who does well and who doesn't, but there are people around the side. I can think of people like Tesla, uh, other automakers around the world, uh, certain states that are right to work states. What are the unintended consequences you think perhaps of this dispute? Look, the unintended consequences are what happens to the number of jobs, not the price paid for each job. The yin and the yang of this, and it's a tough one, is that the more the auto workers get paid, and I'm in favor of them getting paid more, the fewer jobs they're going to be. That's just the inevitable result of this. If you look, for example, back uh, since 2009 at the number of jobs that have moved to Mexico and the fact that there are now more auto jobs in Mexico than there are in the United States, it tells you something about how capitalism and free enterprise works. It finds the lowest cost locale that can meet its needs. Are there potential consequences for the transition to EVs? I mean, I think most people think we're going to make the transition, but could it slow it down? I don't think on an overall basis it slows it down because there's so many players in the EV market. I think it affects who the winners and who the losers are. I think for the Detroit companies to be winners in EV, they, they need help from the unions. They need cooperation from the unions. And uh, we'll have to see how that unfolds. But if the unions make it tougher for them to produce EVs on some economically rational basis, then the Detroit companies are going to end up being the losers in, in the EV race. Uh, in your piece in the New York Times, you point out the ratio of the CEO's payment to wages to, in fact, the average wage and how much it has gone up. I think it was something like from 60 times to 400 times over the, a period of time, right? I think it was even 460 times, but it's something number like times. that, yes. Exactly. Which raises a broader issue that goes beyond the auto companies. As you point out in the piece, it's not just the auto companies where that's true. And that is, in my mind at least, the question about how much goes to capital and how much goes to labor. There has been a shift, without a doubt, toward capital in recent decades. Well, there has been, but I think this is a question of how much CEOs should get paid. They're not necessarily the capitalists, they're employees, actually. And I think, uh, I think you can argue that the auto workers ought to get paid more because the CEOs are getting paid more. I think you could also make an argument the CEO should get paid less uh, because these numbers have become, have become crazy, uh, have become crazy. In 1979, I think I used in the piece, the CEO of General Motors made less than a million dollars a year. And now today we're in the 25 to $30 million range. That is, that's a, a huge increase. And as you point out, that's happening all across the economy and that's a whole nother subject perhaps for another day, but CEO pay is a, and, and C-suite pay is a real issue. What does this say potentially to investors like you uh, making investments, not just in the auto industry, about whether you invest in the auto industry, but more broadly, if in fact there is a shift back toward labor that's got to squeeze margins, it's a practical matter, does that mean that the prospects for equities come down some? If all that happens, the answer is sure. I don't think we know yet. Yes, there are a lot of strikes and a lot of high, what look like big pay packages coming through. But you also have an economy on the other side where companies have more pricing power than they used to. Uh, there's less competition, frankly, less antitrust enforcement, fewer, uh, fewer unions in general, and so forth. And so profit margins, companies have stayed you know, surprisingly robust. Corporate, corporate profits are far uh, higher right now than I think most people thought they would be at this point in a cycle. And so, yeah, uh, sure, corporate profits could get squeezed a bit. Maybe they should get squeezed a bit. But I don't think that's, the, uh, that, uh, that's not what keeps me awake at night. <laughs> what does keep you awake at night? Well, if you want to talk about this area, I think, I think the whole future of manufacturing is a conversation to have. President Biden uh, has been clear, and so have a lot of other people, that they would like to see a manufacturing renaissance in this country. The IRA and some of the infrastructure bill and other things are heavily tilted toward making things here rather than elsewhere. But we have, have to recognize that we cannot produce most things on a globally competitive cost basis. 
We just have too high of a wage structure. We have too high of an overall cost structure. We have much uh, tougher environmental restrictions, which we should have, in my opinion, but which add to cost. We have permitting problems, which add to cost, and now those are unnecessary. And so uh, I, I expect that, uh, so people who basically say we're going to have this big manufacturing renaissance, I think are kidding themselves and frankly kidding the American people. Steve, it's always great to have you on. Thank you so much. That's Stephen Ratner of Willett Advisors, and he is fortunately a regular contributor to Wall Street Week. Coming up, we wrap up the week with special contributor Larry Summers of Harvard. We've still got very real risks to the soft landing scenario. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We're joined once again by our very special contributor here in Wall Street Week. He is Larry Summers of Harvard. Larry, thank you so much for being back with us. Let's start with the Fed. We did hear from the Fed today. We have a new statement of economic projections. What did you make about what we heard from Jay Powell, the chair, about where we are? I thought broadly it was in line with expectations. Broadly, it was reasonable. I think the tilt to being worried about inflation was correct. I still think the Fed is considerably too optimistic. It's possible that we will have the proverbial soft landing, but I think the risks that inflation will be worse than what they say are very real. You've got the UAW strike. You've got oil prices having spiked. You've got a budget deficit that this year will approach 8% of GDP if you take out the student loan accounting uh, item, and you've got a variety of technicals like in health insurance that are getting ready to uh, kick in. So I think you've got real concerns on the inflation side, and at the same time, you've got concerns on the other side that the consumer, since Labor Day, it's not much time yet, but looks like the consumer is slowing a bit. Delinquencies are starting to rise. There's some wall of maturities that's going to come due over the next uh, year. So it's certainly possible that it will work out as the Fed has it with inflation getting back to two, with only negligible increases in unemployment. But that strikes me as more of a goal than a uh, forecast. So I think we've still got very real risks to the soft landing scenario, both from the no landing, continued inflation, the Fed's going to have to raise rates more than it now expects side, and uh, from the fact that every recession that we've had uh, for a generation, people have been talking soft landing right before it, and they've turned out to be wrong. So I think that people are just a little too optimistic uh, right now, and I think the Fed's caught into uh, that uh, optimism. And, you know, on the one hand, things won't be any better than you aspire for them to be. On the other hand, it's a good idea to under forecast and overperform. So it's a very difficult balance that the Fed has to walk. But uh, my suspicion is that it's more likely than not that they're either going to get surprised on the higher inflation side or on the weaker output downturn side, or possibly both could materialize in a stagflationary kind of dynamic. Larry, you mentioned the UAW strike that is ongoing as we speak here, and the risk for the upside on inflation there coming out of that. What do you make of where we are right now in that? Because my point of view looking at it is I'm not sure where these parties can come to yes between the two of them. They seem to be almost really opposed to one another on, on some very basic things. Look, it's always easier to compromise on numbers than it is like, you know, how big is the wage increase going to be than it is on principles, like what's going to happen to the battery uh, factories. It's easier to compromise on numbers like the size of pension packages than it is on uh, questions like uh, changing the separate wage structure for recently hired uh, workers. So they've still got questions of principle as well as questions of numbers separating them. So this may go on uh, for a while. And I think there are two big questions. One is, 
What will the spillover be to the larger economy and to the Midwestern economy, including through price increases if cars get uh, scarce and what that means for automobile and used car uh, prices? I also think there's some real questions here about when you have these highly publicized labor conflicts and uh, you see what's likely to be a big number for the wage increase, I suspect that's going to give a lot of workers in a lot of places some pretty big ideas. And that may be a source of wage pressure as well, which complicates the uh, issues around uh, inflation. So this is a very difficult thing uh, to uh, manage. And I suspect it's going to be one of those things that will be with us for quite a while. Well, you raise a really important, profound point here. Is it possible we're looking at something more than a couple of labor disputes so into more of a fundamental shift in the power between capital on the one hand and labor on the other? Because we've had this with the ports in Los Angeles, we had it with UPS, we've got the Writers Guild out, there are a lot of other ones. And as you know, Larry, there has been a shift in the past, really, away from labor and the power of labor. You've even talked about the importance of organized labor. I think that's the question. I mean, I think there's no question my mind that a lot about what's happened in the economy over the last several decades can be explained by changes in labor power. I think that's contributed substantially to increased inequality. I think that's contributed substantially to rising wage differentials between industries. I think it's probably been a contributor to the flexibility that's allowed the normal rate of unemployment to come down as well. So it's been a two-edged thing. And we may be looking at things go uh, in the opposite direction. Uh, Larry, you have been outspoken on this program and elsewhere about the plight of Ukraine and what the United States and the West should be doing, particularly when it comes to some of the, the Russian government assets, not private, but government assets. We've had President Zelensky, of course, at the UN in New York this week, then going on to Washington. Uh, where are you right now on what can and should be done with respect to per perhaps reparations for Ukraine? I would just say this. It does little good to win wars if you don't win the peace. The peace in Ukraine can't be won without a viable economy that's able to look to Europe. That's got a price tag that's measured in the hundreds of billions of dollars. There are enormous global needs that are already unmet for climate change, for pandemic, uh, for uh, Africa. It's a very difficult budgetary time in the United States and other major economies. What those facts say to me is that we're not going to find hundreds of billions of dollars for Ukraine in our budgets, and that if we find a lot of money, it's going to be enormously expensive money in terms of what it means politically and in terms of what it means for the rest of the world. And there's a place we can go for those resources. We can go to the assets of the Russian state that have already been seized and frozen and made unavailable to the Russian state. So it's practically necessary, morally right, and legally entirely uh, legitimate. And I hope that President Zelensky will push President Biden on the issue. I hope that President Biden will push his lawyers. He's had pretty flexible lawyers when it's come to matters like student debt relief, when it's come to matters involving environmental protection. It would take a lot less flexibility to free up resources here and in Europe for uh, Ukraine at a critically important time. And by doing it, we would also make it possible for the world to have a much more robust climate change, global poverty effort uh, going forward. Larry, thank you so much for being back with us on Wall Street Week. That's Larry Summers of Harvard. Coming up, come as you are. 
but to work and in the Senate? That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Finally, one more thought. Clothes maketh the man. So wrote Erasmus in his collection of adages from 1508. Though a version of this particular adage can be traced all the way back to Homer or maybe even the Babylonians. Until recently, many the man walking the halls of power, that's whether corporate or government, took the maxim quite seriously, invariably showing up in the uniform of a well-cut suit, a white shirt, and a power tie. The richest 1% of this country owns half our country's wealth, $5 trillion. And women haven't been far behind as they adopted their own versions of power suits. Hold all calls, Miss McGill. Yes, Cynthia, thank you. Can I get you anything, Mr. Trainer? Coffee, tea, me. <laughs> Isn't she right? That'll be all. But the pandemic may have changed all that as people learn to work from home where it didn't matter whether you were wearing your power suit or your track suit. People who sat at home, which I'm not a fan of today, uh, People who were home were dressing casually, but I think that the world is going very much in a different place. So as CEOs chafe at their workforces not showing up at the office, at least physically. My golden rule is don't put the genie back in the bottle, you can't. Uh, on the other hand, it's not a complete, this is not an employee choice. They don't get to choose their compensation, they don't get to choose their promotion, they don't get to choose stay home five days a week. I want them with other employees at least three or four days. They may want to consider giving the incentive of some extra perks, like Meta did just this week with its announcement. Meta is restoring its happy hours. It's giving out uh, branded T-shirts once again. It's trying to boost morale. Yeah, you said the two magic words for Carol Masser. <laughs> boost morale? I think morale she just put in her application. Happy yeah. happy hour. And now it turns out that no less than the United States Senate is moving to loosen its dress code for our nation's highest elected legislators. Until now, the Senate required that men wear jacket and tie on the floor and that women wear what they called business attire. Apparently, the junior senator from Pennsylvania, John Fetterman, isn't comfortable in jacket and tie, so he's been turning up in something decidedly less formal and casting his votes from the doorway, prompting Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer to eliminate the Senate dress code altogether so that Senator Fetterman can come into the chamber and do his work dressed however he likes though colleagues like Senator Ted Cruz may stick to the old way. I can tell you, in the 11 years I've been in the Senate, I've only been on the Senate floor in a suit and tie, and as far as I'm concerned, I will continue to, to only wear a suit and tie on the Senate floor. I, I think virtually every senator is going to follow that, or, or for women, the professional dress equivalent. And Senator Fetterman himself has now said that he's willing to put that suit and tie back on if it will get Republicans to agree not to shut the government down. Call me old-fashioned, my wife and children certainly do, but I still think how you dress says something about how seriously you take what you're doing. Now, they're not tell you dress appropriately. I wore this ridiculous thing for you. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg. See you next week.